Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our info information session today. If you are in Arizona, good afternoon. If you are in Texas, good evening. My name is Curtis Endorf. I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of Great Hearts Online. And we are here today to talk about Great Hearts Online. For some of you, you might know a lot about Great Hearts and you're looking to learn more about Great Hearts Online as a public charter option in Texas and Arizona. For others of you, you might not have ever heard of Great Hearts, our organization. For others, you might be looking for a high quality um, online school option for the coming year and years. Wherever you are in your journey, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're eager to tell you more about who we are, what we're doing, and what our vision is and curriculum and program is for your students and in partnership with you. Before I get started, I want to start off by telling everybody about Great Hearts. We are a wonderful organization. Our core purpose is to cultivate the hearts and minds of students through the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. That is a high bar. And you'll notice in here that it doesn't talk about academic achievement or other pieces. To cultivate students, to, to facilitate moral, intellectual, aesthetic student formation is a very, very high bar. And that is what we're aiming towards. That is the purpose and the North Star, the North Star that we are pointed towards. And yes, students learn a lot and uh, are incredibly engaged through a rigorous academic program along the way. There's this quote that we use, liberal education consists of cognitive, emotional, and moral education thinking deeply, loving noble things, and living well together. We believe with Plato that the highest goal of education is to become good intellectually and morally. That is a different core purpose than many schools. And I want us to start that way because this will be a different conversation than many conversations you might be having. As we learn more about Great Hearts Online, you're going to hear about what parents have to say. You're going to hear about uh, what school will look like for school, uh, what, what schedules will look like for your kids. I wanna start off by sharing some of the feedback that our parents have said. Three out of four families who attended brick and mortar schools in the fall are more satisfied with Great Hearts Online than what they did before. 100% of families who are in Great Hearts Online right now are more satisfied than the, than the public charter school, the non-Great Hearts public charter school they were in the first semester. And 92% of former district families who went from a district school to Great Hearts Online are more satisfied with Great Hearts Online than what they've done before. We hope you find that same home here with us. Before we jump in, I want to share a video, a day in the life of a Great Hearts Online scholar to help to paint a picture of what we hope this looks like for you and what our vision is. Maya and her brother Marco sit down at the kitchen table to start their school day. In homeroom, Mrs. Vasquez greets Maya and helps the class get organized for the day. After reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, everyone heads to first period. In English, Maya's excited to participate in a discussion of Anne of Green Gables. Yesterday, she read a chapter and watched a video with questions to help organize her thoughts. Maya's teacher helps the class explore the story's setting, including the time period culture and geography. Next is math, and the class reviews some proportional relationship problems from the previous day. Mrs. Chen watches them work while giving individual feedback using Zoom chat. At the end of class, Everyone answers a few questions, which helps Mrs. Chen tailor the next day's lesson to their understanding. In history, Maya participates in a lesson on Lincoln's House Divided speech. Mr. Baldwin annotates the text on screen while asking the students questions about virtue as well as facts. Maya loves this speech and feels inspired by the abolitionist's courage. Maya plays a fun review game with her classmates in Latin class. Then in science class, there's an experiment. Together, Maya and her dad watch a short video about the role earthworms play in making healthy soil. Then they go to the kitchen and take out a small container from the refrigerator. Maya guides her father through the experiment 
and takes careful notes as he drips water on the worm. When the experiment's over, they take the worm outside and put it in the garden. At lunchtime, Maya and her mom sit on the back porch with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. On the laptop, other families are on screen for a lunch bunch meeting, chatting and telling jokes. With all her live sessions done, Maya has a flexible afternoon. She stays outside for art class, spending an hour filling pages in her sketchbook. After that, she heads to the den to read Anna Green Gables. Finally, it's time for soccer practice, and Maya goes to play with her friends. Back at home, Maya sets the table for dinner. When the family's done, Maya finishes her ELA homework, and her mom comes to help with math. Together, they watch a short video. Then Maya attempts some new problems and submits a photo of her work. She had some trouble, but that's okay. Mrs. Chen will help her understand everything tomorrow. Her homework finished, Maya closes the computer and goes off with her mom to read together before bed. Tomorrow's another big day at Great Hearts Online. We've been building that vision here in Texas for the past several months. Uh, Great Hearts Online currently operates as a K-6 public charter school in Texas, and next year we're planning on expanding to K-8 as a public charter option in Arizona, as well as a public charter option uh, in Texas. Uh, there's a few topics that we're going to talk through today. The first is school design. The second is daily schedules. The third is the student learning experience. Fourth SPED services, including English language learners, student with 504 plans, um, fifth enrollment, and then we'll close out with Q&A. So please put your questions in the chat um, uh, and we'll field those and organize them and close out with some Q&A at the end of our information session. To move to our next topic, I wanna to introduce a number of my colleagues to join me. We have thought long and hard about how to create an authentically great heart school in an online setting and how to incorporate best in class practices, um, really professional grade practices of online um, in an even better way. Uh, that's true to our mission. That's true to our relational approach. So I'd love to have our headmaster, Heidi Vasiloff join, our assistant headmaster, Jamie Twerdek join, our Director of Learning Design, Jay Bach Huber, our Academic Dean and Fifth Grade Lit Comp Teacher, Emily Sullivan, our Senior Learning Engineer, uh, Eric Hebner. The six of us are gonna talk through some of the intentional design pieces and choices that we've made as, we've, as we are building right now and are operating Great Hearts Online that we're continuing to iterate upon every day, every week. Um, to make it better. The first of these design choices is our Great Hearts curriculum. We are fully a Great Hearts school, and that has meant translating things from a brick and mortar design to online, but there have also been some beautiful opportunities to go deeper or to provide some different flexibilities or to encourage more independence from our scholars. Headmaster Vasilov, tell us a little bit about you and tell us a little bit about how we approach curriculum um, at Great Hearts and more specifically at Great Hearts Online. Good afternoon and good evening. I'm so delighted to be able to speak with you today. Um, I was a headmaster in Arizona Great Hearts School for about five and a half years, a teacher prior to that. And uh, when this opportunity came up to really work within the online environment, kind of had to seize the day. Um, we want this, um, we want to be able to offer Great Hearts to anyone who chooses to join us. And this online environment allows us to expand that mission and that goal. So a little bit about our curriculum. I delight in our curriculum. And I would say that in both the brick and mortar school and in our online school. And one of the things that I was most concerned about is, can we do this thing in an online environment that we've been doing in our brick and mortar schools. And I will tell you that we've worked very, very hard and I am excited about what we're seeing. And I will say that we are not only following the curriculum, but we found ways to 
maybe make it a little better in some other areas. We'll just kind of hold on to that for a second. Um, as well as being able to still engage in Socratic discussion, still go deep into math and understand the why. We've been able to do science experiments both as a demo and have them do it at home. So be ready for a little mess um, to, to explore history and to not only look at it from every class, you know, you, you have this lecture that goes in and this discussion, but then to challenge them to go and find something that they are empowered by in the story of history as they move forward. Every student is engaged in both English and in another language, whether that's in the lower schools in Spanish or the upper schools in Latin, because we know that that acquiring of language is really important at a younger age. And then of course, we believe that every, every scholar, every person has the capacity to not only be an artist, but a musician and to engage in those works of art and to look for things that are truly beautiful and to things that we can find truth in science and in math. So we really engage in all of those elements. I wanna speak real quickly, if I can, Curtis, about the upper, the middle schools, in this case, sort of our five through eighth grade. Um, students have six subjects, actually they have seven if you count music and art as sort of two different categories. Um, every day uh, they'll engage in those activities um, they'll expand in that and they'll um, explore that with their teachers, some days live and some days asynchronously, but they're going to have math and they're going to go through not only just functional math, but conceptual math as well. Um, they're going to be engaging in history, uh, different subjects, different, different time periods at different grade levels, but again, building on that foundation of history. Um, they're going to engage in science and every science is a little bit different. And then in literature, and I, I'm gonna let Ms. Sullivan share a little bit of that as she comes on board, but we believe in these books that they're reading. They've withstood the test of time. They, they uh, compel us to look at really beautiful ideas and to challenge ourselves. Does, is that really a courageous act by Mr. Toad? Is that friendship? Is that, a, is that an activity that, that we would see as a good, a good way to engage in our society? Our goal at the end of this is to have excellent citizens, to have good people who emerge, who can engage in civil, civil dialogue and engage with each other in both every form of communication and who are well grounded in all of those elements. Um, I didn't really speak very much about the lower schools. So Ms. Twardick, I would love for you to share a little bit about the curriculum in the lower schools. This is Vasilov. My name is Jamie Tordek, and I am the assistant headmaster at Great Hearts Online. I, for the past six years, I've been either assistant headmaster or headmaster with Great Hearts, and it's been a great experience. I was a teacher with Great Hearts before that. Um, so I have really, really loved the curriculum. That's been a passion for me. We use Spalding in K through third grade. We actually use it up to fourth grade but it's a real multi-sensory approach. The students, they write, they use their hands to show phonograms, they speak, um, and they also listen. So even for their homework, they are listening to the phonograms and writing them rather than copying them because we want them to recognize those sounds so that they can write unfamiliar words. And then we use Singapore for our math curriculum. We use the three-step approach, which is the same way we teach math in our brick and mortar schools. So first the students learn through concrete examples, and that is they play with math. They get to play with manipulatives. Sometimes um, in our live sessions, the students have a pile of shells or a pile of pennies or whatever they can find around the house. So it becomes a little bit of a discovery time for them as well. Um, and then we move into the pictorial representation of the math concept. So they see a picture representing um, the math concept that they're learning, and then they practice with that and play with that. And then they move into um, the actual numbers in the math problem, um, the more abstract um, part of the lesson. So the students all get to use all their senses as they're learning. And uh, we were talking to some of our kindergartners the other day, and we got to hear them say that their favorite part of the day is spalding. So it was really delightful for me to hear because learning how to read sometimes for kids feels more like a burden, but to hear our students say that their favorite subject of the day is learning how to read, um, I just delighted in that. So um, the, the curriculum does teach to all types of different learners. Um, so 
it's something I really, really love about our curriculum and have enjoyed that. That's great. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Jamie. As I hope everyone hears, we have a robust academic program and model. And a classical liberal arts education is about inviting you and your students into the conversation that has been happening over the past 3000 years, the conversation that has shaped and created American democracy and has shaped and created our society as it is now. We want your students to understand that. And we want all of our students uh, to become citizens in that journey forward. And so that happens in our brick and mortar schools, that happens in our online schools. Uh, and we're excited to continue to share more about that as time goes on. A second really intentional design consideration for us is rigorous content engagement. So you just heard Jamie and Heidi talk about our curriculum, but then a question is probably occurring to you, how do kids engage in that curriculum in an online setting? Right? You, talked to, you heard Jamie talk about like kids are listening to, to sounds and then writing on paper. Like, what does that look like? Um, Jay Bach Huber is our director of learning design, wakes up in the morning thinking about student experience, goes to sleep at night thinking about student experience. Jay, can you tell us a little bit more about how do kids engage in this rich, rigorous content? Absolutely. So what I really appreciate about Great Arts Online is at the core of all our decisions are our learning goals for our students. We, we often look at a lesson and ask ourselves, what do we want a child to be able to know, love, or do at the end of this process? And with that in mind, we can then think about what's the correct approach. Um, and, and Eric will get into sort of the specific tools that we're using periodically when, when he gets a chance to speak. But there's this broad, these two buckets of the live learning, what's happening synchronously with the teacher over a Zoom session like this, and then what's happening independently, working in our learning management system. And during the live session, it's a great opportunity for discussion. It's where we start those Socratic dialogues. It's a great opportunity for review. Students could have been introduced to concepts the night before during their homework, and now they're able to ask questions, to wrestle with big ideas, to get quick feedback that can really be important in directing them. Um, in kindergarten, we've actually found that the live reading is one of the best uses of those times. It's really engaging for the students. They're hearing the words. They're there together. It's a sense of community. And so we've been, been sort of playing with those ideas and experimenting and finding what fits best in each kind of experiment, uh, which kind of experience. So then in that independent time, they can sit, they have more flexibility, they can work a little bit longer, and they're going to be doing um, some sort of quiz potentially, or they're going to be working on paper and then re reviewing it there. Maybe they're continuing a discussion that was happening live in class in an online forum, in an online discussion now, and it's still a dialogue but they have a little bit more time to reflect. Not everyone is quite as sharp in the moment. And so having a little bit of space to stop, pause, think, but still be in, in conversation with their peers can be really, really valuable. So there's a variety of tools we use. There's a variety of approaches, but at the heart of it is, is always thinking, what is gonna be a rich experience? What's gonna be a deep thinking experience, whether it's in a synchronous session like this, whether it's independent involving a computer, or as Heidi mentioned, whether it's digging in the dirt, whether it's doing something in the field, looking at nature, drawing, um, and then of course, drawing connections between a, the different elements of our curriculum, right? What, how can we have art in science? How can we connect history to ELA? And I think that's one of the real strengths as well is we're, we're dividing the real and the digital and connect, or I'm sorry, we're connecting the real and the digital as well as connecting different subjects. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, in that answer, I hope you heard that engagement and rigorous content online is different, but different does not mean a net loss. Different means different. And in some cases, it's actually incredibly beneficial for students and it enriches the conversation and the opportunity to think and engage and to be and do independent work. Uh, and we've been really thoughtful about how that plays out. A third important design element is classroom culture and community. Uh, we have made a lot of big choices around this. We have full-time online faculty and teachers. Great Hearts Online is fully staffed by Great Hearts Online uh, faculty. And most of those faculty have come from Great Hearts brick and mortar schools and have joined our school community. Uh, just like the next person who I'd like to share a little bit more, 
Ms. Emily Sullivan is an academic dean. She also teaches fifth grade um, literature and composition for us. Emily, can you tell us a little bit about how are you creating culture and community in your classroom? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Curtis. Again, my name is Emily Sullivan, um, part-time dean, part-time teacher at Great Hearts Online. Um, I am coming from Great Hearts Monta Vista in San Antonio, Texas. Um, but I, I would love to talk to you with my, my teacher heart today. Uh, one thing we do uh, at Great Hearts Online, it, we are very intentional in what we are doing. And I hope, I hope you've heard that in, in all of us speaking tonight. But we are very intentional with our classroom community and culture as well. Uh, we start each morning um, in homeroom together uh, and we are building relationships with our students. I think as teachers, that is the most important thing we can really do, uh, no matter if we are at a brick and mortar campus or if we are online. Uh, and even as we are online, it's even more important to create that relationship. So in homeroom, we have a special time in which we get to um, learn about each other's passions and hobbies. Um, we will have Friday sessions in which we watch and listen to someone play the violin. And we are in awe of their musical talents that we might not possess ourselves. Um, or we look at other students' pieces of artwork that they want to share. Um, or their pets that are at home and we have that homeschool connection that is wonderful. Um, we also just laugh and giggle and have fun and children get to be children. Um, and it's a really beautiful thing. It is my favorite part of the day being online and live with my students. And I hope uh, that my students feel the same way as well. Um, during literature class, uh, we engage in a variety of conversations, especially in um, when you think about literature. Yeah, we're gonna have a lot of conversations um, about our characters, um, about a lot of different literary elements. Uh, oftentimes we're doing this, especially in fifth grade in our upper grades in breakout rooms. So sometimes it will be a teacher led discussion, but oftentimes it's a student led discussion in breakout rooms. And we have student leaders who rise to the occasion of, this is my opportunity to be a leader in my classroom community. Um, and I love seeing students and their personalities come out throughout the year. Um, it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, we also engage as early as fourth, even fifth grade in Socratic dialogue and discussion with our peers in which we are wrestling with really big questions, of the why of what's going on in the book and not just what it is for what it is. Um, it's a way for us to appreciate beauty um, in, in our great books and in our, in our classical literature. Uh, at the end of each year, I always ask myself as a professional and as a teacher, have I done my best to cultivate relationships with my students? That is the most important thing to me um, and if I feel like at the end of the year, that answer is yes. I know I've done, I've done my job uh, as a teacher. So I'm excited about it. It is something that we are very intentional about. Um, and Curtis, I'm gonna send it back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, a fourth design consideration is, is a tension. And it's the tension between real and concrete things, which you're hearing a lot, and intentional online tools. We don't wanna to use tech for the sake of tech. Um, it has to be, what is the purpose of this? And what are we trying to accomplish? I'd love to have our senior learning engineer, Mr. Eric Kiebner, share a little bit about how we think about this balance and the tension between those two pieces. It really is an interesting tension because on the one hand, we're not ashamed of the fact that we're an online school. But on the other hand, we don't want to just be all wrapped up in technology and forget that our first priority here is to cultivate minds and hearts. Um, tools are important, but they are secondary. They're tools, they're means to an end. I think we've done a really good job of, of grasping that and learning more and more about it as we go along. Uh, I think of cases where, for example, our art teacher asked the, uh, us to bring in a fruit or a flower and look at it and see that we say it's a red apple or a yellow pear, but what are all these colors that are really here? I could fake that digitally, but it doesn't have the same effect as when I'm looking at a physical object and seeing in the real world, things are a certain way. And so that's a case where we, we need that physical interaction to communicate something essential 
um, or we have a, a teacher who's planted a garden and is, is sharing that, that growing experience with, with, with our students. Um, all of us are loving to watch it too. It's really, really exciting. You can't fake that. You can't virtualize that. Um, on the other hand, we have things like uh, our videos for asynchronous education um, have the option for embedded checks for understanding. So as I'm watching this video, it's going to stop and ask me some questions. Hey, what do you think about this? What did you learn about this? Do you like this? What just happened? Um, I can't do that without virtual tools. Um, in Latin, they had this virtual mountain climb they're doing to track progress. It's a great way to engage our students in a way that it's hard to do otherwise. Um, and of course, on the back end side, we have um, analytics for engagement and participation uh, to measure uh, just educational progress um, that, that, are, that are really exciting. There are ways for us to, uh, to see what's going on in a way we couldn't be in a physical classroom at the same way. It's much easier for me to gather data about a large group of students and see how much time do they spend on something when I've got it in a computer than when I do uh, in, a, in a classroom or I'm trying to evaluate how burdensome was this homework really. Um, you know, so we are intentional there. Uh, we're also learning. Um, I have learned that it's easier for our students in many top cases to ask a question in the digital environment than it is in a physical environment. They're more comfortable expressing that with a little bit of a screen between them. Um, and also, uh, just recently, I, I observed a student demonstrate, teach me what it meant to lead in a virtual community. Um, the way the student uh, handled the situation was, uh, was amazing to me. So we're learning as, as we go along, uh, which I think is, is like, we should be kind of cultivating our own minds and hearts too. And I think that's happening. Um, so we Thanks. have these tools. One more thing, one more thing. I have to say one more thing. Um, you know, one of my favorite things I've seen is, you know, the, the note for a teacher of, you know, dear, dear Mrs. Vasilov, this is awesome. You get those digitally now. And there's something really engaging and exciting about a little note of love and encouragement uh, that is visual and expressed that way. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Our last piece is around strong family communication. Um, in Great Hearts, our mission is to cultivate the hearts and minds of students in pursuit of truth, beauty, goodness. That mission happens in partnership with you. And Great Hearts Online is in your home. And we are committed to partnering closely and communicating well. Um, Headmaster Vasloff, can you tell us briefly, what does this look like um, so far this year? Yeah, absolutely. We recognize that we have a triangle approach, even more of a strong triangle than we do in the normal education settings or the traditional uh, education settings. We are a partner. We've got a teaching team, we've got a parenting team, and we've got the student or the scholar in that. So we have to be in communication. Um, there are weekly newsletters that go out from every teacher to our families. Um, the grades, you can see comments on assignments. So there's this sort of, you know, hey, you're struggling on this, or this is what's going on here. Teachers are reaching out. Um, today I didn't see Tommy in class or Tommy seems to be a little late. Uh, so there's also that kind of communication going on as well. But one of the things that's most profound in the way this is happening is um, parents are engaging in this education with us because they're hearing, they're seeing the stories. They are aware of the math that's happening. They're looking and saying, what is actually happening here? One of my favorite things that I've seen this year is one of the families came to one of our coffees and we have coffees with the headmaster where it's just open for them. Come, let's talk. Because we need the feedback from you. We have to be in a two-way conversation. And um, I we were there and they said, oh, the whole family does PE together. And the whole family does art together because they're all independent times. And that's, that's what we're looking for is this engagement in learning because we believe that learning is a lifelong pursuit. And that as we engage together, that's going to bolster and create that in your, in your children. So it's a really profoundly unique opportunity to do this sort of blend between home and school. Yeah. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you everyone for joining, for talking about how we are intentionally approaching the design and building and delivery of Great Hearts Online. Um, so thanks everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and move us forward in our agenda. Coming up next, we're going to talk about um, K three schedules. So I'm going to ask Assistant Headmaster Jamie Twerdek. Thank you, Jamie, for coming back on. 
Um, tell us what to expect in the K-3 daily schedule. What, what, is, what does this look like in, in kindergarten through third grade? Curtis, I would say I'm, I'm going to use second grade as an example because it's, it's in the middle there. And um, the day is, I would say if you're comparing it to your child going to school and having in-school classes and then coming home and having homework, their academic day is going to be shorter than it would otherwise. Um, there's about two plus hours of live instruction. And there's, I would say, about six hours altogether in second grade of learning time. So that involves independent learning and then the about two to two and a half hours of live instruction. And the teachers during that live instruction, something that's really, really important to them is that they're creating some spaces where the students are both challenged academically and supported academically, but they're also feeling very valued and there's opportunities for them to connect with each other and build friendships. So we're creating these different spaces for our students um, to meet both of those needs and to meet all of their needs. So um, during the academic time where the teachers are really instructing a little bit in each subject during that live instruction time, they're working on stirring up joy in learning and really developing this um, curiosity in their students. They're having Socratic discussions and helping students really develop a voice and be able to participate in a little bit of civil discourse. I've gone, I've heard a first grader who's six years say, I respectfully disagree. And I just love that, that they can do that together. Um, we also celebrate virtue during those um, live time hours where the students get a chance to do some shout outs of, I noticed um, Sally was practicing courage um, and then everybody, you know, celebrates and it's really fun for both the young kids and the older kids. So um, we talk about virtue through all the subjects, the characters in literature, um, real people in history. And we each were able to weave virtue lessons into our math classes and our um, ELA classes. It's not a separate curriculum. We also really enjoy discovering together. So in science classes, Mrs. Vassiloff already spoke a little bit about that, so I won't go into detail. But And then there's these other little pockets of time where students get an opportunity to build friendships. They have homeroom time where they do get to share a little bit about the sports they're involved in and get to know each other and share with each other. There are reading groups for K through third. So yeah. they have... I want to go back. I, I think this is great. I, I want to go back to the schedule. because So I'm thinking in through my parent lens, right? I have a second grader, a almost kindergartner, and then two two-year-olds. And for a second grader, um, there's homeroom. Um, if we can look at that schedule again, there's homeroom, I think, for 30 minutes. And then there's a two-hour block of live classes. Is that right? Yes. And then within that time, they're they're receiving, they're they're doing literature, math, history, science, and Spalding is included in that. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Poetry, writing lessons, some grammar. They're hitting all of the core subjects during that time. And then the learning continues, but it's asynchronous. What it, do they still have? like literature assignments, even though they had literature live time? What, what does that look like? Um, yes, that's a, that's a great question. So the teachers do try to target the part of the lesson. Let's say it's a math lesson. They target the part of the lesson that is most important for the class to do together. So there might be some modeling of some new, new concepts, but then the students do have an assignment that asynchronous work is independent work. So the teacher teaches, they talk about it, they interact a little bit, students can ask some questions, there's great modeling time, and then the student uses their independent time to practice what they've learned in class that day. Really wrestle with it. And, and I think this gets to an important piece because there's, there's time and place flexibility for families inside of this. There's live classes that are scheduled, but then there's also flexibility in your day. And as you saw uh, in that video that we started off with, if in the afternoon you want to go for a hike with a family uh, or um, practice the piano, 
Uh, I personally am a classically trained um, pianist. And so practicing the piano was a big part of my childhood and life. Uh, there's time and space in the day for that. And you can think about these pieces intentionally. And the asynchronous assignments connect to the live time in a really, really thoughtfully designed way. Is that right? Correct, yes. The flexibility, I think, is a really, really important thing because families, um, they weave the learning into their, um, into their regular life. So even, even with math, we really encourage uh, the parents and the students to create these little pockets of learning throughout the day. So um, it's just a wonderful and rich learning experience because uh, families can make it work for their schedule and their needs. Thank you so much, Jamie, for sharing about, about K3. You're welcome, my pleasure. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move us on to four through eighth grade. Heidi, tell us what the schedule, what does this look like in fourth through eighth grade and how is it different also from yeah. K3? Yeah, thank you, Curtis. One of the things that we love about the K3 model is we took a class of 30 and divided into two portions of 15 and 15. In the fourth through eighth grade model, we're still keeping the classes very small at 24, but what we've done is we've specialized. So your, your students would go to school. There's the first four hours of the day. We talk about eight to noon as being Zoom session times or times that you're live. Um, they'll have a, a block, a 45 minute, 50, 50 minute block. Of, uh, they'll start off with homeroom just like everyone else does. And in homeroom, again, that's a community building space. Then they go into, ELA, let's say that they follow the schedule, they go first to English and they'll spend an hour within their English class um, reading and discussing and getting ready to write. Don't forget the writing, they write a lot and grammar and all those other elements. They get a 10 minute break, yay, um, and they can go get a snack or whatever they need to do. And then um, they go to math, let's say they go to math next. Again, it's with a math teacher, very specialized in that math section. The next blocks would be science and history. Those are combined, in other words, but they're alternating, not really combined. So they'll have two live sessions or Zoom sessions of science, maybe let's say Monday and Wednesday, and then history would be on Tuesday and Thursday. On those alternating days where they're not in that Zoom session, they still have class. It's just independent work. So um, in that session, they're gonna meet with the teacher twice a week. The other three days will be asynchronous. And then the last block would be your arts block, your arts and language. And uh, they'll have art, they'll have music, and they'll have Latin once they're in fifth grade on. So that makes up the morning blocks. The afternoon blocks is all, all asynchronous. And I should mention a couple of things though, Curtis, just to be really clear. Um, teachers have tutoring. So there's gonna be some tutoring time. Some students are gonna be more encouraged to go to tutoring than others, but there's tutoring time. That happens in the afternoons. Um, we also have Fridays are all asynchronous. So if you're like me, I'm often, you know, I had kids in, in sports and we're always like, oh, can we leave school a little early? What do we do? We didn't just for the record, but um, we would have to leave to go do things. Well, Fridays are asynchronous. So that works upon your, your family's schedule to get that done. And uh, that's when teachers also have office hours. Yeah, Heidi, there's a few things you mentioned on here, um, which I think is really, really important. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing about some questions in the chat from around this. We are a full school. We are a full school. We are a full school. So all courses, we have tutoring. Uh, we serve students with in individual education plans on 504 English yes. learners. We have intervention. We do intentional intervention. We do leveled reading groups yes. and four grade levels. We are a full school with all the robust elements of a rich academic program. And it's inside of it's inside of that and it's with that that parents are giving us a lot of feedback about what they're appreciating. The time and place flexibility, the small class sizes. I don't know if Jamie mentioned this. We have fewer than 15 kids in a class in K through three and fewer than 24 in a class. In, in four through eight, those are intentional choices. Um, we are building an online school community, excellent teachers and instruction, that's just a common feedback strand um, from our parents. And what Heidi is mentioning here and what Jamie is mentioning is that you get remote access to a classical liberal arts institution. Great Hearts is the largest brick and mortar classical school system in the United States. And by joining Great Hearts Online, you get to access that mm -hmm. uh, from your home with flexibility. 
Absolutely. And then I, Curtis, I'm going to add on to that. Let me go to the next slide. I also want to make sure that we're really clear. One of the things that we care about is not having children on the computer for eight hours a day. And that's why our design is really the way it is, right? Um, so they're going to be in those sessions, but they have breaks, they have mind breaks, and you're supposed to look off the computer and do those kinds of things in those break times. But in the afternoons, we've really worked hard for students to be able to engage in learning with a book. So they're going to have classics to keep. They're going to, my, that picture there is my daughter, and I threw it in there because she started in fourth grade, and those were all the books, her classics to keep by the time she graduated from 12th grade. Um, and she was so proud of that. We had towers, and we had the three piles, um, all annotated, all discussed, all written about. Think about that. These are children that have engaged in this literature. So we want them to have books. Um, they're going to take, take notes. We understand that learning is really profoundly different when you write things down. So we want them to take notes and they're going to do art. Uh, the teacher is going to lead them through a live piece of art where they're working together and they're drawing and asking questions. And then when they come back to art, they're gonna have an assignment that's due on that Friday that they finish or complete. And then we have this amazing thing called Artsonium, which we'll show you in another, another session, can't wait. Um, but we want you to know that it's very important to us that the learning occurs. Um, we know that children need time to think independently and we believe that this model provides that. Yeah, thank you so much, Heidi. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm gonna move us to our next topic, which is the student experience and the student learning design experience. I hope you're hearing so far the, the intentionality, the layers, the thoughtfulness that we're bringing to this. And I'd love to invite um, Mr. Jay Bakhubar, our Director of Learning Design, to come on and tell us a little bit more and show us actually, what does student independent work look like? What kind of assignments will students have at Great Hearts Online? Thank you, Curtis. So, I will, I will keep this brief. There is a lot I could show, but I will give you the, the high level overview. So there are, there are different kinds of assignments. There's different ways that students can uh, interact with content and show their thinking, right? Work through their thinking. On the, the simplest level, we have quizzes and these we use for quick formative assessments in the evening. You can see multiple choices you'd, uh, just as you'd expect, but then also we have, um, long form answer as well, right? There's a variety of different uh, quiz question types. And these just serve for, again, that, that sort of checks for understanding midweek to guide the teachers, um, teachers' lessons the next day. Another really important thing we do is that we have um, submissions of paper-based work. And this is, a, this is a science lesson. This is what I was talking about before with the cross-curricular um, connections, which I really appreciate. They're, they're doing art, they're drawing and coloring planets, but then they're also writing, right? They're writing in full sentences, they're writing in cursive, we care about all these things. And then once they've worked on paper, they're fully away from the computer, there's the ability to submit. And so they, they upload a, a photo of it, which they use either using their uh, computer itself or using their phone. Um, in the upper grades, we, have, we show a week's worth of assignments at a time. This would be the assignment page for, for one week in English. And we can get into some more complicated kind of work. So uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, we have this um, video quiz. So the students would be watching this. And as they go along, there are these stopping points where they have questions to answer. The teacher can then view both. They can ensure that the students watch the entire thing. They can see who watched just a portion of it or who actually completed the entire work. Um, they can see quiz results as well. And they can go item by item and see um, which ones were challenging, who did uh, well and who struggled with each one to again address that the next day. And then that can continue into a discussion. And you can see here, this is a long discussion board. There are clear instructions on um, both the quality and how you're responding, how you're both giving your original ideas and responding to those of your peers. And you can see there's now a long dialogue here. The, the students there, I believe there's 65 responses just in this, this one discussion thread from, from one evening with the students going back and forth. It's a really rich conversation about that content. And then finally, one of the, the what I think is one of the most interesting things we do is we can record video. Uh, at Great Hearts, we care a lot about poetry and literature, as we've said, 
We care a lot about recitation and your ability to, to speak the poetry. We care about learning to memorize. Um, and so students can submit videos. And I will show you just one example of a video that was submitted for this assignment. A fairy song by William Shakespeare. Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall, her pensioners be, in their gold coat spots you see, those be rubies, fairy favors, in those freckles live their savors. I must go seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl on every cow's lips ear. What a bow, what a bow. That is, what a bow. yes. So there are, we have other tools, we have other kinds of assignments, but that gives you a, a brief overview of the kinds of work students are doing. So there's great variety in how kids are engaging and what their experience is in engaging with assignments and independent work uh, and showing their mastery of content and showing their thinking and engaging in discussion with others, not just live, uh, but there's a lot of really cr great tools that we're using thoughtfully for the asynchronous times. Jay, thank you so much for showing, uh, showing that to us. For our next topic, I'm going to um, turn it to Mr. Joe Barrera. Um, Mr. Barrera is our SPED coordinator for Great Hearts Online Texas, uh, and we are committed to serving all scholars. Um, Joe, can you tell us what does a typical live tutoring session look like for a student with an individualized education plan with an IEP? Thank you. Curtis, yes, um, as Mr. Andrew mentioned, I am the special education coordinator for Great Hearts Online. And, you know, truly we have a unique opportunity, right, to offer a full range and continuum of services uh, for our students with specific needs. Um, so for, for example, right, uh, um, our goal truly is to keep our small group sessions small, one to three students at a time and to, you know, use the individualized education plans that our students have to, to provide explicit and targeted instruction um, to meet the goals that they have. So for example, if I have a student who needs to work on increasing their accuracy um, in um, mathematical word problems, right? Uh, a math session would start with a five minute warm up of fat fluency, um, either addition or subtraction fluency activities. And then we'll transition into um, explicit targeted instruction on utilizing um, word problem strategies. What is this problem asking me? What action words within the problem tell me to, to add or, or to subtract? And then we transition into um, kind of that guided practice um, where our teachers are able to provide you know, really frequent um, and immediate feedback. Um, one of, I, I've, you know, in my experience, I've heard, um, a, a great quote um, that practice makes permanent, right? And in our small group sessions, we want to practice effectively. And um, I, I, I have instructed my team to really focus on the quality of the work that is being done versus the quantity of work that is being done. And I, I, I really believe we have a huge advantage in doing that through these small group targeted instruction sessions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, as, as everyone heard from Joe here, I know there was a question in the chat before. Um, we serve students with individual education plans who are English language learners, who have 504 plans, who are in the RTI process, students who are struggling academically. We're committed to serving all students um, because we want to, uh, one, it's the right thing to do, and two, uh, we wanna make sure we're building uh, a, a inclusive and diverse society and citizen group for the future. Uh, and that's a really, really important part of our mission. Absolutely. Uh, in that community. And, and Joe's a huge part of making that a reality for us. And Mr. Norfolk, if I may just add one additional piece to that is um, 
we are able to offer all of these services to our students, um, but I am really placing a huge emphasis on providing additional supports to our parents. We have this incredible opportunity to bring right our curriculum into our homes, um, but further, I'm able to meet weekly with the pa parents of, of students with individualized education plans to help uh, troubleshoot any, any concerns that have happened throughout the week. And so that we're not finding ourselves you know, trying to dig ourselves out of a hole, you know, five weeks, six weeks into, into the school year. So um, I'm also able to offer supports to the parents, which is um, huge. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it to our final topic. Uh, Ms. Juanita Flores is our senior registrar for Great Hearts Online. Um, People are asking questions. I know it's in the chat and we're responding to it. What's the timeline? Where do I go? How do I learn more? Can you help us just talk us through the, the headlines of enrollment timeline process next? Thank you, Mr. Endorf. So as you mentioned, my name is Juanita Flores. I'm the registrar for Great Hearts Online. And I'm happy to share the enrollment timelines today. So Texas families can apply now. Um, we're actively accepting applications and offers are extended on a rolling basis each week. Uh, in fact, a number of families received offers just this morning. So congratulations to those families and their scholars. We're very, very excited for you all to join us next year. Uh, we have two info sessions coming up. Uh, so we're really looking forward to sharing more about the student and family experience with Great Hearts Online. Uh, so be sure to tune in for those. Arizona families can join our interest list on our website. That will really ensure you have the most up-to-date information and you'll be notified once open enrollment is live. We're looking forward to holding open enrollment for Arizona on April 19th through April 29th. Uh, and then we will run our lottery on April 30th and start extending offers to our Arizona families. All right, great. So uh, please go ahead and sign up for those interest lists if you're in Arizona. Um, please go ahead and apply now if you are in Texas. And we'll have an information session coming up on April 7th where we'll actually hear from some of our teachers and hear from some of our parents and have them talk to you. There's one thing for me to say uh, what we're doing. It's another thing to hear from the people who are educating your students and from other parents uh, who are in a similar place. So again, next steps, uh, the next info session is April 7th with faculty and family testimonials. Um, in Texas, you can apply now. In Arizona, please join the academic, sorry, please join the wait list. We're getting a number of questions um, and we're in the Q&A time. And so I wanna, I wanna start talking through a few of them. Um, organizing this in real time to make sure we're responding to, to your feedback. There's a few steps I want to go through. So there's a question in here from a few families on, um, I think what people are calling COVID slide or academic readiness. So I'd love to have uh, Headmaster Vasiloff and Assistant Headmaster Jamie uh, Twerdick come join me. I'll start off by saying that um, we are working really hard, and I hope you're hearing these layers of support to make sure that we're meeting students where they're at. And a big part of that is having a thoughtful and intentional assessment strategy. So at the beginning of the year, and when students began in Great Hearts Online Texas in January, we had students take the MAP assessment, NWA MAP, it's National um, Norm Referenced Assessment, as well as Dibbles. Uh, and that helped us understand where students are. And it helped us to group scholars and figure out learning needs. It helped us to come up with intervention plans. It helped us to come up with reading groups. Um, and so we use data not to evaluate in this case, we use data to take productive action to better serve your kids and meet them where they're at. Uh, Heidi, Jamie, if I'm worried about my student being ready, what are some of the pieces that we do to help to meet students and families where they're at? I would first say you're probably not alone. I think a lot of parents are thinking the same thing. And, um, you know, and, and students always come into our schools at different levels. Uh, we are, this is, uh, this August start is a new school. So we're gonna have students from all different kinds of levels arrive, just like we have with every other school that we've opened. And it's shocking, but within 
you know, a year, all of a sudden it seems like, wow, they're, they've all arrived at this place. It does take intentionality. And I think um, Ms. Tordick will talk about some of those things, but I think in particular for me, the reading groups have been profoundly um, enlightening. We group children together where they've landed on the assessments in terms of reading, but they can move up or they can, you know, they can move out, not up. They can move to a different group if they're ready, or they can stay with their peers in that same group. That ability to meet them where they are is really important to us. Also, I think a classical liberal arts um, education really lends itself to a variety of levels because the question could be taken here or it could be taken here or it could be taken here. And that allows students to, uh, to who are those high flyers who wanna explore more to really be able to do that. It also allows us as teachers to identify and work with those children that are down, that are working at a more basic level until they're ready to move up. Ms. Yeah. Tordick? I just would like to add that, you know, for, for these little ones, one thing that we do is we offer tutoring. So identifying the, um, Curtis and Heidi are correct, identifying those gaps early on so that we can help support these kiddos is really, really important to us. We don't want our students to feel frustrated because the, um, the practice is too out of their reach. We also don't want them to feel too bored because they're ahead of the game. So we really try to determine right away where they're at and meet those needs. So differentiation um, in instruction in those live times is happening. Tutoring for both math and ELA is happening and tracking the progress of individual student growth um, is happening. So we're not so interested in comparing your child, our child next to everyone else. It's more important that they are continually growing and learning and engaging in the curriculum. So that is what we really set up um, the learning environment to meet those um, needs and to encourage learning for each student where they're at. Yeah. The, the, I mean, there's a lot more we can talk about. As you can hear, we all, we are committed to making sure that your students learn and thrive. Uh, and one thing that I'll say is the breadth of our classes, science, history leads it to students being successful uh, at multiple layers. Our approach to building knowledge actually directly aligns to the, the most current research on how kids learn how to read. We didn't modify our approach to that. That has always been our approach. And the rest of the country and world is modifying to do things actually how Great Hearts has always done things. Our approach to conceptual mathematics is also uh, the best way for kids to learn mathematics as well. Learn the concepts as Jamie talked about through those multiple steps over time. I'm gonna go ahead and move to a question that's come up a few times. Um, thank you so much, Heidi and Jamie. Um, I'd love to have uh, uh, Juanita Flores come on with me. There's questions on, there's questions on, you know, if I accept my seat, if I accept a seat in Great Hearts Online, what does that mean for, for brick and mortar? So the first thing I'll share is that many of you attended, uh, might have attended distance learning this year, right? Um, and at least for those who are enrolled in Great Hearts, attended, Great Heart, attended distance learning for at least some portion of the beginning of this year. Great Hearts Online is not Great Hearts Distance Learning. Um, there are, as you heard, there's a lot of other layers at play here. There's a whole professional team committed to providing and building a Great Hearts Online school and program. And in the same way, you all will apply to Great Hearts Online Texas, Great Hearts Online Arizona, just like you would apply to a brick and mortar school. Juanita, can you share a little bit more? What happens if a family enrolls in Great Hearts Online Texas or Great Hearts Online Arizona if they transfer from a brick and mortar academy? That's right, Curtis. So we are a standalone academies, right? And we function just the way our brick and mortar campuses do with transfer policies and enrollment policies. If a family enrolls with Great Hearts Online for the 21-22 school year, uh, they would need to complete the entire academic year in order to be eligible to transfer back to a brick and mortar. Uh, and of course, you know, space and availability is, is always a factor, no guarantees. Uh, but I will say that, you know, we understand 
the, the decisions are tough. Uh, and so we will work with you to, to come up with different options and, and to make that decision as best as you can for your family. Great. Thank you so much, Juanita. Uh, a, a third question that's come up is around layers of support. So um, folks saying, you know, I, I work, my spouse works, we're both working. We like having our kids at home with us. H how does that work um, with, from a parent support pr perspective? How do we help our students become independently successful? Uh, and again, I'd love to have Heidi, Emily, and Jamie come back on. I'll kick us off um, to answering that question. How do we help you as parents help your students be successful? One important piece is it is important to have a grown up who can help. And that's increasingly important in lower grades. But what that looks like is actually something that we have the opportunity to teach habits and to teach responsibility. At Great Hearts, we talk about virtues. Uh, and and, and that, that feels like a, a nebulous, uh, high-minded, lofty idea. For little kids, that's habits. How do we build scholarly habits? How do we build academic habits, habits of body, habits of respect? How do we build responsibility so we can track time and tasks and build that into our day? Those are, those are lifelong habits. I mean, we all work on those things. But part of the way we help your students be successful is that we explicitly teach and practice those habits. And that happens in homeroom. That happens through our Canvas platform. Uh, and we're actually piloting right now, I think, in, in fourth grade, an end of day wrap up where we're helping families to capture, yeah. kids to capture and wrap up. All right. Are these the things that you're supposed to do? Are you on track to, to accomplish these things um, to provide those layers of support? So. Um, team, how do we help families and kids be independent and build independence to, to engage? I'm, I'm going to start, but then I want to toss it to Emily. But I just want to say they need a space that's their classroom. If I could recommend one thing right out of the box, make sure that they have a space that's not on the couch, uh, but that really feels like they're entering class. So, Ms. Sullivan, what suggestion do you have? Thanks, Heidi. One thing um, that I really encourage my fifth graders to work on, uh, those organizational habits. I think as you get into middle school, it is so hard. You have so many things going on and, and uh, to stay focused on, you know, the task at hand when you have multiple tasks to complete is sometimes really difficult. So a planner, having a planner or even a simple composition notebook um, to write down your daily assignments is very helpful. This is something that I would do with my students at a brick and mortar campus. And it is something I continue to do with my students online. Um, I do this every day in my, uh, my personal life as well, making that daily to-do list uh, to complete assignments. So very simple thing to do, but helps uh, those organizational habits build and that virtue of responsibility um, continues throughout the year as, as you build those organizational skills. Yeah. Two other things I'd Can add. I Oh, please go, Jamie. Sorry. I'm just going to add one little thing that I've, I've talked to parents before about, and I know it's hard, but if you think of a small toddler, like one-year-old trying to learn how to walk, and you think of somebody coming out of a horrible experience when they're 70, trying to learn how to walk, it's a much different experience. So um, training the children when they're little, as far as allowing them a few consequences, it doesn't hurt much. It's not going to impact their future, but just allowing that. So if they forget to turn in their homework, see what happens. It's a lot easier for them to learn those lessons when they're young without a big consequence than it is for them to not pay an electric bill when they're in college and have their electricity turned off. So those little steps of um, natural consequence are actually gifts for the students. So it's this wonderful opportunity to learn when it doesn't hurt. So they don't have to learn when it does hurt. Yeah. So that would just be an added. Jamie, what a, what a wonderful parent lesson too. I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm going to go home. I'll be a better dad uh, tonight um, for that. So thank you. Two other things that we do um, in Canvas, we provide parents with access uh, to to look in and see what their students are doing in Canvas, so you can you can peer into what your scholars are doing in, through your own account. 
And we are also building training modules. So we provide training ahead of time to families on Canvas. We provide training ahead of time to students on Canvas to help to set up everyone to be successful. Uh, we were able to pilot that and to start off that um, in December and through the winter in our in our Great Hearts Online Texas launch and pilot. And we'll continue to build on that um, in the coming year. So thank you everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and close this up. I know there's a lot more questions that are going on in the chat. Uh, we appreciate your enthusiasm, your really great questions. We'll continue to go through and try to answer these afterwards. And please sign up to learn more, come to our next information session, learn about Great Hearts Online from teachers, learn about Great Hearts Online from parents who have their kids enrolled now. I wanna start us off where I hope, end us up, end us up where I hope we started, which is this is a journey that we are going on together. And we wanna do this in community. I think many online schools are lonely places. They are tactical and procedural places where kids do not feel connected to each other. They do not feel connected to their students, to their, to their teachers. That is the antithesis of what we are doing here. We are building culture and community with parents. We're building culture and community with scholars. And over time, we'll build connections across state lines for our kids. Uh, imagine going to school and knowing people across the United States, across um, Arizona, across Texas, and having those connections and those relationships and what that would mean for how you learned, how you grew up, how you saw and experienced things. It is an amazing gift um, that we are able to offer Great Hearts Online as a public charter school in Texas and in Arizona in the coming year. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you for learning with us and asking great questions. And I hope to see many of you again on April 7th when we come back for our next information session. Thank you and have a great evening.